today we want to get into God's Word, and we started last week, we started a series on, um, on the Holy Spirit, we started what we refer to as the Holy Spirit Sermon Series, and last week we spent some time getting to know the person of the Holy Spirit. So we said to you that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a thing. He's not a thing. He's a person. And we identified from the scripture uh, the personalities. We said a person, right, while there are different attributes of a person, there are three basic attributes of personhood, and that is where a person has a mind, a will, and, an, and emotions. And we shared with you from the scripture how the scripture identifies the Holy Spirit as having mind, as the capacity to think, having that, uh, that ability to, um, to think, to reason. We see that the Holy Spirit had, um, had uh, emotions that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. He can be happy. We also saw um, that the Holy Spirit has a will, that he makes decisions, he chooses. Now, today we want to go a little more in terms of identifying uh, the person of the Holy Spirit, um, but from a different perspective. We want to look at him, um, the old and the new, right? Not that the Holy Spirit is old or new, but we want to look at how he was revealed in the Old Testament as well as how he is revealed in the new. Is that okay for us? Because I think it's important for us to identify in Scripture, as we read Scripture, if we want to understand who the Holy Spirit is, we must be able to identify him in Scripture. Do you agree? So that we can understand how the Bible speaks of him or how the Bible identifies him. So that as we go on this morning, we want to look at a few selected texts in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, that identifies the person of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to look at the New Testament and see how he has been introduced to us and the major purpose that he has been given to us in the New Testament. So, first of all, in the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit being uh, referred to in uh, as you go through the text, there are some references or some, some, some marks in which you can, some statements that you can see the Holy Spirit identified. First of all, he's identified as the Spirit of God. The who? So as you read through the text of the Old Testament, several times you will see the term, the Spirit of God being made mention. You also see him being mentioned as the Spirit of the Lord. That's a little different from the Spirit of God. Sometimes you may see just a reference to the Spirit, right? And based on the context that is used, you'll realize that he, that reference is actually talking about the same Spirit of God. And then there are times where God is speaking himself and he says, my Spirit. So that when you see these terms being referenced, you will recognize that it is speaking about the self-same Spirit of God. So you will see, for example, in Genesis, um, you see the Holy Spirit being used, uh, being identified in creation. We touched on it briefly last day, and we said that in, cre in Genesis chapter 1, you saw the term, the Spirit of God moved. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, when you have it, say amen. Well, verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So he says here, the Spirit of God did what? Moved upon the face of the waters. In fact, this is the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the biblical text. So you, saw, you see that in this text that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God. And you will see that several times throughout the Bible, he is referred to as the Spirit of God. And in this context, we are seeing that the Spirit of God did something. He moved. He moved upon the face of the waters, upon the face of the deep. So the Spirit of God moved. And last day, when we were here, for those of you who missed, we, says that, we said that the, the approach in creation is a similar approach that God has when he's ministering to men today. So, for example, when God wants to do a work, he allows his Spirit to move, he speaks, and then there's a response. So when you look at the creation account, you saw the Spirit of God moved, God spoke, 
and creation responded to what God said. And in our lives today, for, trans, for, for conversion to take place, for transformation to take place, the Spirit of God first moves upon the heart of man. God speaks through his word or speaks through a pastor or speaks through some other means. And then there's a response. I repented. There is a response. My life, uh, I need to surrender my life to God. There is a response. The Spirit of God moves. God speaks. There is a response. And as I said last day, the problem that we have is not with God. It's not with his Holy Spirit. It's the response part. The Spirit moves. God speaks. Man stays still. That God moves. He speaks. His Holy Spirit moves. He speaks and people stand up still and don't move. Can't move. We can't make choices. We can't move out of the life that we are doing. Even though God is speaking and it's loud and clear that this is what God is saying. So his spirit moves. We see the, the, the spirit of God. Say the spirit of God. So in creation, we see the spirit of God. You also see in the Old Testament that when the Holy Spirit moves, he would have come upon men. So he would have moved upon man. And many times as he moved upon man, the word of God will declare and they prophesied. There's some sort of prophetic utterances that came in those days as the spirit of God moved. Either you would have seen that the spirit moved in him or the spirit came upon them or the spirit um, uh, or just they were moved by the spirit of God. Different references and the response after that is that they prophesied. They what? So that there were uh, prophetic utterances after the Spirit of God moved. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 15, verse 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. And he went out to meet Asa, and it said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while you be with him, and, he, and if he seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And then he goes on. So here, the Spirit of God moved upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he prophesied. He spoke what God is saying. Turn also with Peter and Chronicles chapter 24, verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Joachiah, some of these names, eh? Jehoiada. <laughs> Jehoiada. The priests, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that he cannot prosper? Because he hath forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. So you see here, the Spirit of God coming upon Azariah, the Spirit of God coming upon Zechariah, and saying a similar thing, not so? The message was similar. He's talking through these prophets and actually causing them to declare what he wants to say to the children of Israel. Numbers eleven twenty five says, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took the Spirit that was on, upon him, and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit, when the what? When the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So that the Spirit that was rested upon Moses was placed now upon 70 elders. And they did what? They prophesied. And we can go through uh, the Old Testament and you will see similar experiences where people received of the Spirit of God and they had prophetic utterances as a result of the Spirit of God coming upon them. Amen? We see also that in Judges chapter 14 verse 19, that the Spirit of God came upon people, upon a particular man, and he had strength that was referred to as a supernatural strength. That he was now able to do things physically that he could not have done normally. So that you see that when the Holy Spirit came upon people, that they were able to do some mighty feats, some great works. In Judges chapter 14 verse 19, do you have it? 
What does it say? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, and took their spoils and gave the change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went to father's house. So this was spoken of Samson. And when the Spirit of God came upon Samson, he actually did some things real powerful. In fact, Samson, by virtue of his call, by virtue of a covenant arrangement with God, uh, between his mother and God, he received a supernatural endowment of strength. And here at times, the, the Word of God says that the Spirit of God would come upon him and he will be able to do greater things. He will be able to do mighty works. Amen? So he was able to, to now take, um, in fact, one of the things that Samson did, he took a jawbone of a donkey and, and, and killed men. <laughs> right? He mashed up uh, uh, lions and, and he did a lot of mighty works. Of course, he fell eventually. And what the mighty men could not have done what the armies of Philistine could not have done. A single woman did. And it was said of Samson that he got up and he was going to do exactly what he was accustomed to doing. But he did not know that the spirit of God was not on him at that time. We also see the Spirit of God coming in those days and giving supernatural wisdom, skills. There's a very interesting guy that I met in, in Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31 from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel. What's that name? Bezalel. Remember the name Bezalel, especially those of you who are workmen, you work with your hands, remember his name. The son of Uri, the son of her of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. I have done what? I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in the cutting of stones to set them and in the carving of timber to work all manner of workmanship. So, so Bezalel was a workman. He was a craftsman. And the word of God says that God anointed him. God allowed his spirit. He filled him with his spirit in such a way that he was filled with wisdom. With what? Wisdom with all, I fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And why I say I remember him is because of the fact that when we think of the things of God and people who are appointed to do things of God, we only think of the priests and we only think of the prophets and we only think of these persons who would have an oratory gift or who will be able to speak and declare the things of God. But here we saw that the Spirit of God had come upon a man and he had equipped him to do craftsmanship, to do work with his hands. And that's a good thing for those of you who are skilled workmen, who are uh, probably masons or, or, or carvers or, or, um, or joinery, who do joinery, or who probably do, uh, I see we have Nikkei as a graphic artist. Those of you who are skilled with your hands, you can receive an, an anointing from God to be able to have the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to do that effectively. And that's an awesome thing, that God moved in this way upon men. So they received of the Spirit of God in this context. In Judges, we see one more that I want to point to. That when the Spirit of God came upon men in the Old Testament, they had administrative and leadership ability. Judges chapter 3. And you hear, in this context, he's referred to as the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. 
And the Lord delivered Cushan Rasha Taim. Cushan Rasha Taim. King of Mesopotamia into his hand. And he had prevailed against Cushan Risha Tahim. So what we're saying is this, that, that the Lord, where was I? You see an administrative capabilities here, right? Where leaders of nations can be brought, can receive now a wisdom and, a, and a, 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 an ability to lead and to judge nations. And you saw that many of the kings of Israel, this was a judge, and many of the, the kings of Israel, right, um, would have received that type of wisdom. In this case, uh, this gentleman, uh, Otiniel, he received this wisdom from God to judge Israel. He became a judge, and he did so effectively. In fact, so much so that in his time as a leader of Israel, right, uh, of God's people, there were 40 years that there was no war. You understand that? So that when he served, right, the land rested 40 years. So that when the Lord is giving you, uh, in those days, when the Lord was to appoint someone as a leader, they would have been anointed. The Spirit of God would have come upon them and that they would have had that administrative capabilities. Josh, um, David, David was anointed by the Spirit of God to be king over Israel. And the Spirit of God was upon him. When Israel was led by Saul in, the, in his early stages of leadership, the Spirit of God was upon Saul. Until he started to do a lot of queer and contrary things, he moved away from the plan and the purpose of God. And then you heard that the Spirit of God left Saul. And of course, an evil spirit came upon him. And that's something interesting because we also see that in the Old Testament, while the Spirit of God would have come upon man, it was not a permanent dwelling in man. It, wasn't, it was more or less like temporary. David himself in Psalm 51 uh, verse 11 prayed God. He appealed to God, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And this is why it was important for Christ to come. Because when Christ came, he brought in, he ushered in now a different move or a different dispensation of the work of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit was not just to visit man like he did in those days where specific people. And that's another thing that we took note of, that there were specific people, a handful of people who would have received of the Spirit of God in this way. Not so? And I saw that, like, for example, of a million people, right, who, is, who Israel, who, who um, Moses had to lead, you saw 70 people receiving of the Holy Spirit in that way, in addition to Moses. But then now you see Christ coming, and a new testament, a new covenant is being ushered in. And Christ is introducing this person of the Holy Spirit. And he introduces him in John chapter 14. You see here, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be, abide with you forever. That he will do what? And this was one of the most significant differences with the coming of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant from that with the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. In that the Holy Spirit is coming now as being introduced by Christ to abide with us forever. Amen? And here we are seeing, look what he goes on to say, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, the world cannot receive, because he seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be where? So it's not that the Holy Spirit shall be just be upon you. So it's not just the coming of the Holy Spirit upon you. Or the coming of the Holy Spirit on you. But now he's saying is that the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to be in you. 
And I think that's important for us to understand because we are looking now at the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And here you see Christ speaking about the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within you, in you. And that's an empowering thought. That the Spirit of God can be on the inside of me? Wow, yes. How many of you all want that? And we want to look at two aspects now of this Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was there in the Old Testament, that we just spoke about, that we just identified. He is now coming as God in us. And he's coming now as Christ in us. Now, as God dwelling in us, why do I say that? Because, well, for those of you who missed last week, we identified about the triune nature of God. We say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say that we have one God who exists in three persons. We do have three gods. We have one God, and this one God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we broke down that last day. But what we want to look at today is three references from the scripture that uses the term that, use, that speaks of the Holy Spirit and speaks of God himself interchangeably. So turn with me first to Acts 5, 1 to 3. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, with Sapphira, sorry, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? What did Peter ask the man? Why did, people, why did Satan fill your heart to lie to whom? The Holy Ghost. Now we need to understand the context of what this was speaking of. In those days, in the early time of the church, people were so much so connected and in love with each other who were Christians and believers that what they did is that they counted all that they have as all that we have. I don't know if you got what I'm saying. So that it wasn't that I had this and you didn't have. It was that if I have, you have. So what they did is that they sold all that they had and brought it into the church, and then the church leaders distributed it evenly. <laughs> that that sounds good. Some people say yes, some people say, nah, you're mad or what, Pastor? So if you had a piece of land, you'd have sold the land and bring it to the church, and then they would have been distributing accordingly. If you had a house, if you had a mansion on the hill, you sold the mansion on the hill, you come, you, you, and then they distribute it evenly. That's how it was at those days. Thank God it's not like that again. It was the first, it was the only time it was referenced. It was not necessarily something that was to be repeated over and over and over. But the love and unity was to be repeated. Not necessarily this particular way in which it was done. But at this time, it was required of all to sell what they had and bring it in. And this fellow, he sold the land. He and his wife, they owned the property. They sold it. And then they brought money to the church, but they didn't bring all. And somehow or the other, the gift of God that was working in Peter knew definitely that they didn't bring all the money. Hmm, let me see how much people sell land and sell property. And, and you pay a tithe on it, or you didn't, or you pay part. Hmm. Good thing the Lord don't move as he did in those days. Let's see how he moved. And Peter said, why does it remain? Was it not thine? Was it not yours when you had it? He said, yes. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Yes. Why then? Why hast thou conceived this 
thing in thine heart. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto whom? Unto whom? So first of all, he says, why have Satan filled your heart to lie to whom? The Holy Spirit. And now in further explaining it, he says to you, to, to, to the man, you didn't lie to men, you lied to God. So that the same Holy Spirit that he spoke about here now, he said you're lying to the Holy Spirit. Satan fill you in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Because he knows that the Holy Spirit is who is going to bring the revelation of what you did. So how in the world are you going to think you can lie to the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is God. And that's why he came back and said, you didn't lie to man, but you lied to God. And that's a very important thing for us to understand, that the Spirit of God, he is God. He is the person, the third person of the Godhead. And here you see him being referenced there. Let's look at another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 16. Knowing not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwell in you, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, and ye are holy. And which temple ye are. So what he says here, knowing not that ye are the temple of God, the whom? The what? So Paul is speaking to the church, and he's saying to the Corinthian church, you didn't know that you are the temple of God? Now, a temple of God speaks of the dwelling place of God. Not so? Not so? So that he says, you are the temple of God. But who, he says, dwell in you? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. We see a similar thing um, being said in, the, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of what? Wait, wait, wait. Didn't we just say body is the temple of God? Didn't Paul just say that just three chapters before? Verse 16 of chapter 3 says, keep where you are. But verse 16 of chapter 3 says, what we just read, know you not that you are the temple of God. And here in chapter 6 verse 19, he says, what? Know you not that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And you are not of your own. So he's using this term interchangeably, isn't he? So that he says first that you are the temple of God. And now he's saying your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that there's an interchangeable perspective here. That you, the Spirit of God now, is God. You now having the Holy Spirit in you is having God in you. So that the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. And that is what is God dwelling in us. And many times we miss that. We miss that understanding. So we want God to dwell with us, but we don't want nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. And it can't happen. Because God in us is the Holy Spirit in us. So that we must see the Spirit of God at work. Amen? So he says here, what? And I like when Paul speaks like this because he say, wait, wait, wait. You didn't know that? So all this time you were in church and you were in things of God and you didn't know that? You didn't know that the Spirit of God is in you? You didn't know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You didn't know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? How come? How come you didn't know that? And that's a something that we had to throw to us. Because for many of us, we grew up in church for many years and we didn't know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We didn't know that we are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us. We think that the Spirit of God is for some special deluxe edition Christian. <laughs> that is only specific Christians will have the Holy Spirit. That's how we think, not so. That some people have made us to think that it's only if you are a Christian from here or if you are some pastor or if you are some apostle, then and only then you have the Spirit of God living on, dwelling in you. And that we, the, the normal Christian or the normal everyday person on this, uh, uh, who does go to church, he can't have the Spirit of God. And it's not the truth. 
that the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a believer in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we're going to show you how this happens. Is that okay? We saw that in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came upon people. But now we are understanding that the Holy Spirit wants to dwell in us. That, he, that Christ came to introduce him to us. And we see that the Holy Spirit, we see that the Holy Spirit is God. We said that the Holy Spirit is God dwelling in us, right? Did we just say that? Do you agree with that? So the Holy Spirit is who dwelling in us? But look what John chapter 14 is saying. Read it for me again from verse 15. Read it out loud, please. Go ahead. Even the spirit of truth. Stop there. Jesus is saying that you will receive another comforter. And this next comforter is called the what? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. He says that the world cannot receive him because he seeth him not. The world does not see him. Neither knoweth him, but you know him. You know who? Who is he him Jesus is speaking of? The Holy Spirit. Or this, let's use Jesus' term here, the comforter or the Spirit of Truth. And he says that you know him, for he does what? He lives with you and shall be in you. Now what Jesus is saying is this, that this spirit that you're going to receive is going to be living in you. Not so? But pastor just come and tell you it's the spirit of God. But Jesus is saying now, you know him. He living with you now. And he's going to be in you. Even the spirit of truth. You know him. He dwell with you and shall be in you. Who was Jesus speaking of? He was speaking of whom? Himself. Because he's saying here, look what he says. I will pray the father and he shall send, give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he, because he, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What Jesus is introducing here now is that this spirit that you're going to receive is my spirit. I am coming to you in spirit form. Right now, I am dwelling with you. Right now, I am living with you. Right now, I am here with you. But guess what? I am going to be in you. I am going to be dwelling in you. I am not going to leave you comfortless. I want to be in you. All the time, I am outside of you. All the time, I am with you. But now, I want to be in you. So what we want to receive is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is the same Spirit of God. When we talk about having the Spirit of God and we talk about having the Spirit of Christ, it's the same thing that we are talking about. In fact, let me correct myself, it's the same person. That the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ is the same person. And he comes to dwell on the inside of us. So when we talk about Christ in me, it's the Holy Spirit who is the Christ in me. We can't talk about us now having Christ in us without having the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of us. 
the Christ in me that we talk about is really the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The Spirit of Christ who comes to dwell on the inside of us, to empower us. And next week we're going to talk about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and what he empowers us to do. We're going to see approximately 10 items or 10 things that the Spirit of God empowers us to do from the inside out. So what you are looking at, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus is defining here now and introducing the Spirit of God coming. And the Spirit of God is His Spirit that is going to be deposited in the people who believe in Him. Amen? So we see that the Spirit of God, Jesus is saying, I will come to you. I am that Spirit. I am the one who is going to come to reveal myself unto you. The work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So let's look back at that scripture in, um, in 1 Corinthians. The one in chapter 3. Verse 16. Read it for me, please. You didn't know this? What? what? No, you not? What? For the temple of God is what? The temple of God is what? The word holy means set apart. It means sanctified. The temple of God is what? Who is the temple of God? You think this is the temple of God? This is a rented facility. <laughs> you understand? And before we came here, this was a soap factory. Well, it was cleaning things, actually. <laughs> That's, uh, but be, before we came here, this was a soap factory. This is not a temple. Because we, as the temple of God, came here, this is what makes this place holy. Because of the purpose for which we are coming here, this is what makes this place sanctified and set apart. Prior to that, it was not. What he's establishing here is this. That the brick and mortar is not the dwelling place of God. God doesn't dwell in temples that were made with man's hand. That's not where he, his dwelling place is. Even though in the olden days, in the old covenant, you saw the tabernacle and you saw the distinction of the temple that was built, that's not the dwelling place of God. We can't contain God in that. But God has chosen to dwell in the hearts of men. And he says that you are the temple of God. But then he goes on to say something that is profound. That this temple is holy. This temple is set apart. This temple is sanctified. What makes that happen? Because we have accepted Christ in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. That whole work of, is called a process called, a big word, sanctification. Where we ourselves become now set apart to be the habitation of the true and the living God. To be the dwelling place of the true and living God. We have been set apart for that purpose. And that's profound. It shakes me up. It causes me to stand in awe, to recognize that God saw it fit to pull me aside and pour his spirit in me. He saw it fit to pull me aside, to set me apart as a dwelling place for him. And it all started off because of my recognition of who Christ is. And in fact, we could not have recognized who Christ is unless the Holy Spirit would have moved on our hearts firstly. But you have been sanctified. You have been set apart. And that's something that we need to understand and not take for granted. Because when we take that for granted, what happens is this, that we utilize this temple and we go and join this temple with a whole set of contrary things that does not please God. When we don't understand that you and I are the temples of the Holy Spirit, 
we take the temple of God. And according to the word of God, what fellowship has the temple of God with halots? We can't do that. That's what he's saying. And this is why he's asking, you did not know this? So that we have gone through our Christian life not understanding that the dwelling of God is in us. That we are that abiding place. That he wants to dwell on the inside of us. And he wants our lives to be pure and holy. To be sanctified means to be made holy. To be what? You know what's the challenge with that? Our religion has taught us that we can't be made holy. Our religion has taught us that once we have walked the face of this earth, we cannot be holy. Yet God has says, be ye holy, for I am holy. But religion continues to tell us you cannot be holy. Because only God is holy. And God is telling us now, I want you to partake of my holiness. But it can't happen on our own. It can't happen in our own efforts. It can't happen in our own works. You cannot do enough works. You cannot make enough personal sacrifices to become holy. It's not about how much beads you count. It's not about how far you walk barefooted. It is not about what scars you put on your hand. Or whether you cut your hair bald or you keep it long until it grows. That's not what makes you holy. What causes us to be sanctified, brothers and sisters, is the work of the Holy Spirit coming in us to confirm what Christ did on Calvary. Because you see, what happens is this. Can I borrow you for a little moment? Come here, sir. Is that if this was Christ and the sacrifice, put your hands out like right, turn to the congregation. If this was Christ and the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, you remember that that in the Old Testament that made something holy was the sacrifices, not so? They would have done the blood sacrifices and they would have taken the blood and sprinkled it on the altar to make it holy. And they would have done a lot of these things to make things holy, not so? So that what happened now is that this final sacrifice that was made in the person of Christ Jesus is what covered us now. But what God did is that this holy man, Christ Jesus, he took what was on Christ and put it on you. Because of us identifying with the sacrifice of Christ, because of us identifying with what Christ did and coming in submission to him and to the work of Calvary, he took that which is in Christ and put it in us. So that we can now be sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. We can now be sanctified by the work of the Spirit of God. That the cleansing agent of the blood of Christ is now applied to me. So that I no longer have to be counted as being a sinful, slothful sinner. I can now stand under the blood of Jesus. And be sanctified in the name of Jesus. Because of what Christ did. The Holy Spirit works that on the inside of me. The Holy Spirit takes this and puts it on the inside of me. So that forever I remember Calvary. So that when I walk, I remember Calvary. I remember what Christ did for me. When I take communion, I remember Calvary. That's what it's about. When we talk about being sanctified, it is this work that set me apart. It is the Holy Spirit that brings that to the fore and now works on the inside of me. Something that reflects on the outside of me. That's what happens. So the life that I used to live, 
I can't live that way anymore. And that's why I say, what other people may do, I cannot do it. Others may, I cannot. Why? Because of the sanctifying work of Christ in me. The Holy Spirit is who does that. He allows us to be set apart for his honor and for his glory. Thank you, Jesus. So he says here, the temple of God is holy, which ye are. And this is the reason we got to live our lives differently because of what Christ did. And the Holy Spirit works that on the inside of us. Each one of us, as we pursue our Christian walk, we got to understand how this process of sanctification works in us. And what he does is this, that he brings us to a realization of our own shortcomings. How many of you all are perfect here? Let me see your hands. Nobody here? Not one person here perfect? Yet. Somebody say yet. And that's a good response. Because none of us are yet perfect. But guess what? We are being perfected in Christ. And that's what he wants to work in us. To become perfected in Christ. So, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Now, Romans chapter 8 is a real powerful passage of scripture. And I want to encourage each one. You remember sometime when we were talking about sin and and having dominion over sin, I, I pointed to Romans chapter 6, and I shared with you all to study the entire passage of Romans chapter 6. Well, this is another homework you have. Read the entire passage of Romans chapter 8. Study it in its entirety. But let's glance now at verse 29. What does it say? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be what? Conformed to the? Of the image of whom? To be conformed to the image of whom? That, we, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom he also, whom, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them also glorified. Right? And we can go on. And in this we see a lot of doctrinal truths that actually has split different sort of um, elements of Christianity. And in it you have justification, predestination, you have this whole concept of sanctification, redemption, all these things are tied into this, this particular verse. But I want to center in a line in verse 39, 29, sorry, verse 29, that says here that whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Predestinate simply means to be predetermined to be saved, to be set apart even before. But the purpose of our predestination is to do what? To be what? Conform to what? The image of whom? To be conformed to the image of? His son. Our whole objective in life with the working of the spirit of God on the inside of us is to come into conformity to the image of Christ. Is to do what? Come into conformity to the image of Christ. Our whole objective of Christianity. The word Christian means Christ-like ones. So when you call yourself a Christian... You are saying to others, I am Christ-like. So you could see how plenty of people lie. <laughs> you understand that? Because when you see a lot of people, oh, I'm a Christian. Ooh, is that what Christ is like? I wonder if you get that. So now, 
so that the work that we want to be able to see happening in us is what? Christ-likeness. And the Spirit of God is what brings that to pass in our lives. It's who brings that to work, to fall. That the Christ-likeness, the change of our nature, the change of our character. You see, what he says is any man that is in Christ is a new creature. Not so? All things are passed away and behold, all things are new. So your character becomes new when you are in Christ and when Christ is in you. So that who we got to look like now is Jesus. That's who we got to look like. That's the image that we got to have before us in who we want to look like, Jesus. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So what we are saying, brothers and sisters, is that our life has to be different. Our life has to start to reflect something different. And the person that we got to start resembling is Christ Jesus. Say Christ Jesus. So that uh, that change must take place. Go up a few verses. Verse 11. Romans 8, 11. Take it from verse 10, sorry. Can you read it for me, please? And if? If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but... So the body is dead... And what causes the body to be dead? Sin. But the spirit comes alive because of what? Now read the next verse and see if you could hold on to your seat to this, with this next verse because I, I just jump. And what does it say? But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. Stop. The word quicken means bring to life. Your mortal body, the same body that we just say was dead in trespasses and sin. What he's saying is this, that if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also raise up your mortal body, shall bring to life that same deadened body. By what? His spirit that dwell in you. So we see that the spirit of God that dwells on the inside of you is doing our work from the inside to the outside. So that that which is happening on the inside of you is causing something to happen on your body. My God. He says the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Did Jesus stay dead? So that there was some power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that power is the spirit of God. And what he is saying is this. That's the same power that is at work on the inside of you. That he lives on the inside of you. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus. And if it is that he lives on the inside of you. He's going to bring to life that same body that was once dead in sin. He's going to cause this body to come alive. He's going to cause you to be quickened according to the King James Version. He's going to make life come into your mortal body by the same spirit, by his spirit that dwells on the inside of you. Therefore, brethren, what did he say? Therefore. So as a result of this, because we understand all that we have said, because we understand that we are the dwelling place of the temple of God, we are the, sorry, the temple of God, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Because we understand that the Spirit of God dwells in us and quickens our mortal body, we owe this flesh nothing. You didn't get me there. We owe this carnal man nothing. He said we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. 
the Spirit of God living on the inside of us cancels that debt. You didn't get that. You see, all this concept about a car walk right and a car live right and once I'm in this flesh, I've got to bound to have to must to live an ungodly life and, a, and the only time we're going to be free from sin is when we get into the new by and by. Well, let me tell you something. That's a deception to make sure you don't get to heaven. You understand what I'm saying to us? Because now that I am in the flesh, because of the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of me, I am not indebted to this flesh. And that's the empowerment that we need now for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that we are no longer indebted to this flesh. You can walk free from carnality. You can walk free from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We can walk free from all that delib those deliberate sins that we have continued to be in, those habitual things. What the Word of God declares is the be besetting sins. We can walk free from it. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. Now, he says also, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. So we need to ensure that we have the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us. And next week, we're going to continue on. Because you will see that with the Spirit of God on the inside of us, there is now no condemnation. Once we start living under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, and we allow ourselves to truly be surrendered, you're going to see a power at work that breaks off the power of the enemy in our lives. That we can have victory in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? So what we are seeing, brothers and sisters, is the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. He came upon men, right, in the Old Testament, but it was a temporary. Yes, he empowered men to do great things. He empowered men to do a lot of great things, prophesied and, and to have skills and, and all these things that we just, <coughs> sorry, and we just spoke about. But then he came in the New Testament, not to just come upon us, but to indwell us. The old was upon, but the new is in. So that when he comes in us now, he comes with a power and an influence to cause our bodies, our natural bodies, to be unquickened. That we in this flesh can serve God. That we can now live our lives in a way that is pleasing to Almighty God. Let us don't continue to live defeated lives. Let us live in victory. Let us live the life that God has designed for us to live. Don't try to be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this transformation, brothers and sisters, brings us to be conformed to the image of the Son of God who died for us and gave himself for us. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. And brothers and sisters, we want to see Christ living on the inside of us. And he does so through the person of his Holy Spirit. Amen.